Hello everyone. We spent a lot of time over the last couple of weeks talking about North Korea. Um, and I might mention it in today's report as well, but first of all, let's talk about some other people, specifically Russians, specifically Russians who are against this war and who don't want to participate in this war. So in the past, um, in the past wars, uh, there was a term coined um, called conscientious objector, uh, objectors. And um, if you watch historic dramas, uh, specifically about World War II, um, such as Foyle's War, for example, uh, it's discussed that subject of being a conscientious objector to the war uh, is discussed quite a lot. And so those people still would work toward the war effort. They just refused to go to the front and shoot. And there were a lot of tensions. You kind of can see the point from both sides. But um, in some cases, um, there could be a police action against people like that. Uh, in some cases, not. In Russia right now, you cannot safely be a conscientious objector. So these people mentioned in this article are getting the hell out of there. The path they're following from the legal and immigration standpoint is the um, political persecution uh, path. So that actually exists in uh, multiple immigration systems uh, around the world, including in the U.S., um, the difference is between different countries, how hard it is to prove that you are facing potentially, uh, persecution, torture, possibly even death, if you are not allowed asylum in another country. In U.S., it is incredibly difficult to prove. Uh, one of the biggest complaints among people see seeking asylum in the U.S., specifically pe people fleeing uh, oppression and political persecution, is that you could be dead <laughs> before you finally uh, get through, before your proof is finally considered sufficient. So these men are fleeing at this time to France, um, France is the first EU country that now allows former military personnel who oppose Russia's invasion of Ukraine to enter the country without a passport. Um, however, uh, there are other issues and other concerns, uh, you know, obviously with a lot of the Russia-initiated acts of sabotage, cyber terrorism, etc. I think this process is going to become more rigorous. Um, so we'll see. Also, if these men are truly objecting to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Putin administration and so on and so forth, I hope they use their newfound safety to spread the word, to educate people about what is happening in Russia, the, um, the lack of democracy, the lack of freedom of information, the draconian rules about anyone who um, dis doesn't agree with the government line, and so on and so forth. So in other words, I'm hoping they would do something more useful than the current so-called Russian opposition. Okay, so there is this, um, that this is true. Uh, there is some fierce fighting going on. And we now have so, sort of a double whammy in terms of intensifying fight, fighting. So several things going on. First of all, you, you already know about the Donbass region, the Donetsk Luhansk region. So that's in the east. But there's also intensifying fighting in the Kharkiv region. We're back in Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine. 
Um, I'm sure you've seen the uh, news about more aerial attacks against Kharkiv. So from the conversation uh, with my parents just today, uh, we have one family member fighting in the Donetsk region, another one who had just been dispatched into the worst of it in the Kharkiv region, and we have um, yet another uh, family member who is a, um, an army doctor, an army medic uh, in the Donetsk region. So all of them are in extreme danger. Um, the one who is the medic hasn't seen her children in six months, and we sometimes don't hear from them for weeks because there is no safe and reliable way for them to send any word about themselves. There's been another strike against Ukraine's capital, Kiev, and also against Poltava. Uh, what I'm surprised nobody is mentioning is that my native city of Zaporizhia, where my parents live, has been now uh, bombed for two months straight every single night. Um, I asked my parents how they were holding up. They're not holding up well. Uh, basically, they sleep in uh, two to three hour snippets between uh, air raid alarms. So that is going on. I invite you to imagine what it would be like for you to not be able to sleep for two months in a row because you're being bombed. So this is important. We, we've we had several large prisoner exchanges so far. And here's the thing. So the reason I think Ukraine is requesting specifically the details on who is currently in Russian custody is to have something in hand to prove that not everybody appears to be alive who was taken prisoner. And I can completely understand that because we've said this before. We already have evidence of Ukrainian POWs having been tortured and killed in Russian custody. So we already know Russia is in violation of the Geneva Convention. And so I think Ukraine is trying to get some paperwork on hand to have proof and say, hey, thus and such has been taken prisoner in, say, March of 2023, but he's no longer on the list of prisoners available for exchange. Why is that? And then there is this. And somehow, in light of everything else, this surprises me not at all. So what are we talking about? Um, if you're following um, some of the video channels that are covering the war, you have seen the um, camera footage from Ukrainian drones as they go flying, for example, at Russian tanks. Well, the same camera equipment is also on the Russian drones. And it now appears that, you know, based from some of the footage, that the drones are purposely targeting civilian population. And again, we know this, been there, done that, got a t-shirt, that Russia is going to deny these allegations. But then again, they are denying having bombed out apartment complexes and hospitals and kindergarten. They are denying having murdered Ukrainian civilians, including children, so this wouldn't surprise me at all. However, this is happening along with the glide bombs, along with the missiles, and so on and so forth. When I asked my father about it, um, he, he said, you know, if only we had permission to use long-range weapons, we could stop those glide bombs before they got to us. But unfortunately, as of right now, we have nothing. 